Okay. Hello. <laughs> How are Hello. you? Okay. Yeah, great. Um, well, it's a pleasure to meet all of you. You as well. You as well. You too. This is a huge issue is with this current crisis is what do we do, especially in the performing arts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so no, I, I salute your, uh, your inventiveness and in putting this thing together. <laughs> Thank you. We know that we were, we were talking last night that even, even Berlin has been seeing some of the, the protests that we have here. Like it's, it's, really, it's really spreading across the globe. Yeah, you mean these recent ones around yeah. George Floyd? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's an intense time. Yes, <laughs> we've been, we've been... We, were, we were chatting with, uh, with Aaron Cassidy the other day, uh -huh. and he, he was very adamant about contemporary music's position and role in that, that process. He said, I'm, I'm ready to make some really ugly noise now. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, how are you? How's, how's writing been amidst lockdown? You know, I have my library here, which is great. The difficulty is that, um, you know, we have a, a daughter, and so now we're kind of homeschooling as well. So that's, uh, that takes a lot of energy. I have to presume that she trusts you with, with math homework? Uh, we, I do do the math, yeah. I do the <laughs> math and violin. <laughs> she said violin, so. Excellent. But, um, you know, it's tough to get them to, to practice at that age. She's eight. You know, you have to start them young. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, we spent the last week talking about, about your music, about a lot of it, about your writings, your writings on other composers, your music, your realizations of other composers' music. Um, mm -hmm. And I, we were just all so st stunned and struck by how many different places your, your inspiration, your, your music draws upon and how, just how many different sources you find in your creative, in, in your creative inspiration. Yeah, uh, well, the, the, that's important for me to kind of um, explore as many possible areas as one can. And then the composition becomes a site where all of this kind of knowledge and information and references somehow are forced together. Mm -hmm. So for myself, that's, that was, uh, th that's important. Mm -hmm. It strikes me how, like you said, that it's a site for all of these things to come together, but there's also sort of a, a listener responsibility within the piece to sort of create and, and we're a part of the action. Like we were, we're an actant in the, in the process of creating form of, of identifying those, um, those relationships, right? It, it very much involves us as listeners. Uh, well, yes, definitely. Um, I think um, involving the listeners, demanding something from the listeners, you know, I mean, I still adhere to this, the idea that um, to experience art, to experience especially complex works of art that requires work. Mm. It's, it's not just simply a passive form of consumption. It requires, it demands something from the listener or from a viewer. And I think it's this kind of relationship between the work and, and the experience of it that can fundamentally change um, a listener or a viewer's, um, their worldview mm. through coming into confrontation that with something that may be um, difficult at first it may resist them at first, but, it, but after time, after spending time with something, they um, begin to kind of go outside of their own biases, their own preconceived notions of what art, what beauty should be, right? I mean, Lachman once described beauty as the rejection of habit, you know? Mm -hmm. The idea that beauty is so much tied in with the idea of resistance in, in, the, in the work. Um, these things are important for me um, because they, uh, they offer a, a potential for art to kind of um, change the way that we see the world, the way that we move through the world. There's, and there's sort of a similar, I don't want to say battle of resistance, but I guess there is some resistance in it. You know, you, you'll sometimes pit different, like completely contrasting cultures, works, styles against each other in the same, in the same piece. The, the process of resistance of that resistance of, of habit for those for those sounds those melodies to act in their in their, their normal their normal manner creates a very different beauty one that most I don't, I don't think most people really get to experience too terribly often yeah no no that's that's a nice way of putting it i mean um yeah in my work there's references from many different things 
but it's um, what's also important is um, for me a, a, a kind of understated uh, idea behind composition that to me is still extremely important today is the notion of polyphony. Mm. And the idea that to bring in all of these things so that it doesn't just simply collapse into a kind of montage. Mm -hmm. where The montage is the kind of ideology where somehow all these things can coexist without actually disturbing each other. Mm. That's the kind of capitalist montage mm. of, 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 of um, postmodernism. For me, <clears throat> it's to bring these things into a, the same space to manage them quite precisely. Through, through polyphony and counterpoint so that, and it's then through their montage, they're bring, bringing them together in the same compositional space that one has the potential to create energy. So for me, the, that's an important aspect to kind of draw relationships between um, very discrepant things, mm -hmm. but simply not just throwing them into the same pot and just hoping, hoping for the best, mm -hmm. but really to, I mean, this is the act of composition to actually compose the two things together, to draw them into relationship. It gets to this notion of aura that, that, that Lachman often talks about. And what's important about this notion of aura is that it's another way to kind of bring two sounds into relationship with one another than simply their, their um, immediate physical characteristics or their um, language associations in terms of gestures, et cetera, but that um, one can also draw relationships between the kinds of references, the kinds of aura that something may um, mm. connote. And my, my particular perspective is that the issue with Lachemann is that aura for him is primarily relegated to the German Austrian tradition. Mm. And I think that um, for a 21st composition, we can do more than that. We can actually. Um, take more speculative risks and actually draw relationships like I'm doing in this, the, the opera that I'm, I'm working on now, drawing a relationship somehow between um, Kun Chu, Chinese early opera singing, and the Sprechgesang of, of Schoenberg mm -hmm. in the 1930s, uh, to somehow draw these into a relationship that just doesn't become a kind of stylistic montage, which we see very quite often. And then what happens is when you just simply bring the two into the space without actually composing out the relationships between them, then what happens is you just reaffirm a certain hierarchy. And in this case, the Western classical tradition would always get the upper hand. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it's we can actually enter into a poetics of composition that is more fundamentally democratic, more mm -hmm. um, a, a way to kind of upset the, the, the hierarchies of traditionally classical composed music um, without rejecting it. That's why I like this sort of rejection of the term just quotation, because it's beyond quotation. It's not just picking something up out of its context and dropping it down and leaving it as it is, right? It right. forces it to di digest with something else. Yeah. Yeah, it comes into, well, I mean, you know, the, the beautiful example is the opening of, um, I think it's the Opus 132 of Beethoven. You know, he brings in, for example, references to the style Gallant at the mm -hmm. time, which was kind of, um, which was kind of seen as, as a bit simplistic. And if you look at, for example, the later works of Bach, like the duet in the Klavierbund Drei, um, he has this wonderful duet where he completely mocks the simplicity of the, um, of the style Gallant. Beethoven doesn't do that. What he does is he has references to that. He has references to what he would call the old style which brings up the aura of someone like Palestrina, mm. and then the classical style. And what he does in this opening is that all these three things, they, it's never simply one pitted against the other, which in, implies a certain kind of value judgment. They begin to actually interact with one another. He composes the three so that they, in a way, they live in some kind of um, strange uh, relationship to one another. And then they begin to change, you know? This is, for, for me, this is the idea of, of the virus. Like a lot of my work I would suggest today deals with this notion of virus because mm -hmm. virus requires some kind of host cells that, that my music somehow infects and it begins to kind of, um, and it uses that music to kind of permeate and upset the kind of already composed hierarchies within that music. Mm -hmm. So if, a lot of my music now is, is tr really transcription based. Mm. We think of um, 
with Miranda's Atemwende, which is the second act to um, the Geister. And so the entire first part is really a, a transcription of um, Erwartung by Schoenberg. But what I do with that is um, a lot of my process is taking, say, Erwartung by Schoenberg and remapping it into a very different metric and rhythmic space, oftentimes influenced by, um, by something outside of music, usually poetry, for example, because I think there's a very strong relationship historically between poetry, spoken text, and, and music. So what happens is when I begin to map something like Schoenberg into this very different metric and rhythmic space, it begins to deform and fundamentally change certain hierarchical relationships that were originally in the Schoenberg, particularly around what he would call the language of music. Language of music centered around notions of gestures, of how we express ourselves. You know, it's, it's something that I think as composers, we can never get around. Um, whenever we set down to kind of draw relationships between things on, on, in the score, and whenever we attempt to express ourselves, ultimately, we get into the thorny area of, of language, musical language, the mm. desire to express. So what this remapping does is it often fundamentally distorts this whole language-like aspect that we see in, in Schoenberg's music. In my own music, then that opens also possibilities. Um, this idea that I, I like from biology, um, this notion of reverse transcription. One could say that what I do now is are reverse transcriptions. Reverse transcriptions are when we have, I think it's the, in the genetic mapping, when um, the RNA sends a code to the DNA, we can get these feedback loops where then the information is then sent back the other way. And it's particularly when we get these feedback loops, this distortion in the information flow that, um, that uh, certain diseases, certain um, pathologies can arise, genetic pathologies. And what these pathologies are, are in, is essentially noise in the signal. And mm -hmm. so if you look at something like Miranda's Atemwende, it's, um, it's opportunities for really composing out the kind of noise-like aspects of, of, of the Schoenberg's, of Schoenberg's music. You know, um, so someone like Lachman has this important idea called the structure clung, which for me is an important idea, the structured sound. For me, this is a space, a compositional space. It's a space of conflict, really, between what I would call language and the body. Mm. And the body refers to what, um, what Lachman refers to as this music concrete instrumental. And this is this aspect of when we want to express ourselves, particularly as performers, there's all this noise that is kind of secondary to it, you know, um, not just the sound of breathing, the sound of, of uh, all the um, incidental sounds, you know, on the violin, the sound of just the, the fingers moving across the strings, the kinds of sounds that Lachman in his early works began to kind of use as primary compositional material. But what's, in, what, what's interesting about these is that these, this, what I would call, it's the materiality of, mm. of music. Mm -hmm. Sounds materiality can actually cause a certain resistance to music's language-like aspects. Language-like aspects is the di desire for expression, of wanting to say something. And I think at least that's the way that I, I conceive Lachemann's notion of the structure clang. It's really this side of conflict between the two. And so in, in my own work, what happens is that when you have this site of conflict between the kind of physicality, the materiality of music and expression, th then what happens is that it, it gives, it opens up the possibility ability to destabilize um, the whole language-like aspects of music. You know, the gestures all of a sudden become very unstable gestures, especially when all of these things are being mapped in a metric and oftentimes using polyrhythms that completely deform and decenter the notion of where the gesture, where I feel secure in performing the gesture. Mm -hmm. So for myself, what's important about that is that um, you see, in, in, in Schoenberg's music, we really reach a height of representational music, where he's able to, if we think of Erwartung, for example, all of the music um, that exists around the singer is really a kind of 
psychological manifestation of what's going on in the singer's mind. Absolutely. You know? And so what Schoenberg does, and this gets to the notion of the musical idea, he's able to kind of psychologize the music so that every aspect of the music is infused with a certain kind of reverberations of what's going in, on inside of the mind mm -hmm. of the singer, right? That's the basis of, of expressionism in music. Mm -hmm. And what Lachman does is he takes us a step further and he, rather than putting it into the psychology of the mind, he puts it into the body. Mm -hmm. So that then what happens is rather than always pointing to the psychology of a, of a subject, I would argue, um, Lachman always points it to the body of the subject, mm -hmm. the body that is producing these noises and is in a way um, in conflict with what it is it desires to express. Right, and, and I think that's the, the beauty of all the kind of language of noise in Lachemann's music. It's precisely the fact that, um, that the materiality of sound and, and the desire to express things through sound don't always match up because materiality is something that is part of the real world. It resists us trying to kind of inframe it and control it, right? Speaking of Lachemann, it just, it just reminds me of, uh, of Metien. Right, das Mädchen is an, it's not about a psychology of a character, it's about the freezing of the space around her, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's that very physical manifestation of cold. Um, yeah, yeah. That it's, it, it is that very materiality of the body in that whole opera. Yeah, sure. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely about um, the physicality of, of coldness. It's about the, the, the body there, very much so. Which is why you have these movements just about the the sounds of shivering, you know the whoop 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 whoop. You know um, what I would say though in both cases, in both someone like Schoenberg and and um, Lachemann, is that the notion of language there one always points one at least one can always point to the notion of a stable subject position within the music, mm -hmm. a point at which one is speaking, whether one is speaking in terms of a kind of psychological reaction or one is speaking in terms of a pure physical reaction. And this, what this means, at least in, in my work, is that the notion of the gesture is always centered in some way. Mm. That language always has some kind of hierarchical basis to rely on. We see this in Lachman, especially in the later works. The danger, I would argue, with the later works is that noise becomes less and less of a kind of resistance to the desire of expression and becomes more like a filter. Mm. And then when you enter into a situation like that, then the music takes on a very, it takes on a nostalgic aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like, like hearing Strauss or Bruckner through a kind of broken radio. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, so I guess what, what I'm interested in is, is proceeding from this position, but also um, creating a music in which there is never any possibility for a stable subject position to mm. speak. What's extremely important is the metrical and rhythmic foundation of my work. That is really the ground plan. Because then when a gesture gets mapped onto that, it becomes completely distorted and distorted away from its original desire of, of intention. And in that sense, then um, we get a certain kind of uh, confusion. We, the, the gestures always, there's a fundamental sense of instability with, with, it, with a given gesture. Mm. This, this idea of, of displacing the, the subject against a metric grid, it just, it strikes me as something that's quite difficult to do when you're facing a, uh, a stage drama, right? Where something like, something like The Tempest, where the subject is supposed to be so clear, right? We're supposed to recognize, you know, that it's either, it's about Miranda, it's about Prospero, right? And so how do you, how do you work that same idea of metricity into something that also has a representative aspect to it, a, a staged element, a visual element. Well, in, in that case, you mean, um, you mean like the theme, the, the theme of the Tempest, there's a certain kind of narrative there, is mm -hmm. what you're saying. Implicit subject. Yeah. Right? yeah, right. So, I mean, the way that I dealt with it in, in the Geister Insel um, is that um, there's a loose thread of the Tempest plot there, but I bring in many other kinds of texts in, into that. I'm not sure if I would call it representative, but it's um, the story of the, of the, of this tempest is still roughly there, but it, it really also just simply becomes a space in which 
all of these other texts can begin to rub up against one another and be montaged against one another. In that sense, potentially create meaning, not in terms of meaning as a storyline and, and character development, but really meaning in terms of the juxtaposition of different texts. And it's like the, the beginning of the Rana Zatzim Benda, there's, there's so much text coming at you from, from different voices, different places. And what we sort of have as a listener have a responsibility in deriving that meaning, right? And finding, in pulling those texts out of the, the musical framework um, and focusing okay. on, on this, focusing on that and trying to hear them as a collective text rather than as trying to identify which text comes where. Oh, right, so in this case, you mean text as, as music, not as spoken text or sung text. I, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm interested in hearing both of your, both of your thoughts, right? In, in that instance, it's spoken text. I, I was thinking fairly explicitly about that second, that second scene, right? Uh -huh. where, there's, where there's so much spoken text underneath all, I guess I don't even know if I call it underneath, um, alongside all of this music. And like, we're sort of, we're sort of pushed to hear through the music towards the text. And, and also hear it as a part of the music. Well, I mean, the, the text is actually quite minimal mm -hmm. in, in, in that essentially what I did with that is there are certain syllables from the original Pappenheim text, mm -hmm. but only syllables. Mm -hmm. And then, um, then occasionally we get these um, poems by Paul Ceylon. Mm -hmm. yeah. The idea here is that um, unlike the original work by Schoenberg where um, really the text, the voice is kind of at the top of the hierarchy and all of the instrumental music responds to the voice, mm -hmm. right? And it's a kind of manifestation of the voice. In my work, the idea is that um, the voice really becomes part of the overall sonic landscape. So the, the idea is to kind of go against a certain hierarchy of voice above and instruments below, but really, um, that they all exist within a kind of the same plateau. Mm. And you'll hear this with the voice. Voice is actually quite minimal and it's, it really is nestled in with, among the sounds that we hear, um, occasionally coming out in the foreground, but, um, but by no means dominant really mm. for, for, for any, any moment of time. It sort of goes against what we sort of assume opera to be, right? We're so accustomed to that hierarchy of opera, right? Voice, accompaniment, and the story fits in there. Right. right, right, right. Yeah, well, in this case, um, yeah, what I wanted to do was, was, was to really um, go against that, that notion of hierarchy. Partly it gets back to this notion of, um, of trying to create a music in which, um, again, a, a, a stable subject position is, is, is really never attained. And at the same time, the kind of domination of the human voice becomes actually simply marginalized. Mm. Um, mm. so that other sounds can kind of um, coexist with it. I guess one could even call it the, um, a kind of poetics of the a Anthropocene, you mm. know, the idea mm. of, of creating a certain work in which it's not that the human voice is, is completely absent, it's there, but it's, it's marginalized, mm. it's dehierarchized to allow other sounds, other possible forms of expression to come to the, to the listening surface. At least for myself, this was kind of the meaning of what Cage referred to as an anarchic harmony, of somehow achieving, which I, which I do think he achieved in these late number pieces, somehow achieving a kind of music that escapes, uh, that escapes human intentionality to, to some sense, um, or at least that the, the human desire is somehow placed in the margins. And what would a harmony like that mean, you know? And so to me, it's interesting that he achieved that in his late works when Schoenberg early on said, you have no feeling for harmony. And he said, I'll just keep beating my head against the wall mm -hmm. until I do. And then he achieves a sense of harmony, which I think is very, is quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. So you, your ability to fluently speak on, on so many composers, um, I, I, you know, I, of course, there's so many composers who who know and understand the, the lineage of Western classical music, but your relationship to, to these composers is, I think, a lot deeper than we often really get to either hear about or, or see, both in your music and in, in your writings. Uh, I'm just curious to, to hear about your perception of the composer as, as existing in time, right? As both creating a, a future music, as well as sort of 
filtering and bearing all of this past music with them? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I do think we have a certain responsibility to the past, but yet at the same time, we can't be constrained by it. You know, I, I, I did my um, education in the States mm -hmm. and then, and now I'm teaching in, in Germany. And um, to me, it's, that's a real um, cultural distinction as well. Like in the States, it's kind of, especially when you study composition at the master's or doctorate level, it's really like um, everything's possible, you know? And which is great because it opens up this kind of freedom, but it's also problematic. Mm. Uh, it also leads to some problems as well. On the other hand, in Europe and Germany, because of the, the history is actually a little much more like the States, but I, I, I give another example of where I've taught in the past, which is Italy. Mm. And Italy is the other end of the problem where basically um, composers have to study, do all these stylistic studies for like 10 years before they can even think of writing their own piece. Mm. And what happens is it completely cripples them. Mm. In fact, they've told me it just, they want to compose, but their creativity has been crushed out of them from a kind of very authoritative education. I think it's important to kind of, to somehow have both, you know, and for, from my own experience, it was easier to kind of begin I mean, I'll, I'll give you a sense of what my um, development was, and you could probably sense that just through hearing the CDs that are out there of my music, which is when, I mean, I came from a position of writing, you know, uh, music that was very much influenced by um, traditional music, et cetera. Then when I came to San Diego, where I did my doctorate, things completely changed, and I kind of went to a degree zero where I, where I exercised everything out of my music. And I remember the, the first piece I wrote there was this duet for um, clarinet and cello. And all I had was just a breath sound through the clarinet and a kind of, um, and a batuta sound of the bow hitting the, the strings. That was a painful period for me because I forced myself to build compositions out of the most reduced material. Mm -hmm. um, and, if, and, and I have the CD of these early chamber works these are the works that came out of this period. But what was important was it, it, um, it brought together two important aspects that have always been there from my compositional interests. One is um, fascination with sound and, and experimentation with sound, and also with a structural thinking. But the whole language-like aspect of my music, which was kind of naive in my, in my 20s, when I got to um, San Diego, it was also kind of un underdeveloped because completely exercising things like gestures and all of these things that we associate with, with the tradition, one could say, all the language aspects were still there and dealt with in a more kind of, I would say a naive way, but, but they weren't really in, on the surface because when you reduce your music to um, completely noise music, for example, at first, it's not apparent, but but that's a um, that's an illusion. It's an illusion because then um, what I noticed is that I was writing these noise works and um, that were structured that allowed me to explore certain things, but in the way that I would express gestures, even with just a crescendo, mm -hmm. still was very much coming out of this kind of unreflected relationship to tradition. Going back to Lachman, this is what what he refers to as tonality in music and. He gives a, a good model that for me has, is, I would say, also is important, although I would develop certain aspects of it. But what he says is that there are kind of four aspects that fall into the whole compositional process. And one is the kind of physical acoustic aspect, which is just what I would call sounds materiality, mm. which is also re then related to the kind of music concrete instrumental. But just being aware of the kind of pure physical, uh, sensual aspects of sound and sound production. Mm. And then there's the, uh, what he calls the uh, structural aspect, which uh, for him, it was invoking certain, at least rudimentary serial procedures. For myself, it's invoking um, serial or mathematical procedures, but also taking um, uh, mathematical procedures from other works like, uh, like poems, like taking the rhythmic structure from a poem using that as the foundation for a piece or from a film using the, the timings of shots. 
in, in other words, the notion of number is extremely important here. And then there's what he calls the language aspect. And this is, he has this whole notion of, um, of sound types and uh, the cadence sound. Um, but essentially what he's referring to are the way that we intend things in music, the way that we desire to express things. And that happens through um, tension and relaxation, through crescendos, through um, cadences, uh, and through things like that, that are that too often are unreflected, especially mm -hmm. when we dive deep into the materialist aspect of music, we can forget about those things. And then what happens is we start writing pieces where we enter into this very sonic rich materiality, but yet if we listen closer, they seem to fall into very um, typical, familiar, tonal patterns mm -hmm. of, cadences of crescendos of tension and relaxation. So I think it's important that these things are put into some kind of critical awareness. And often the way I do it is that the structural aspects of a work and the language like aspects often work in conflict with one another. Hmm. And so often what this means, like in um, Miranda's Ottenbender or the, this ensemble piece I'm working on now, which relies on uh, Schoenberg's variations for orchestra is oftentimes borrowing the language-like aspects from other works and mm. remapping that into a very different structural domain. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, it's the, the aspect of aura, that to be more aware of the different kinds of associations that music can have. Um, and and for, for myself, someone like Zimmerman is a real master at this. It's the, the difference between if you listen to, to Zimmerman, like the Soldaten, the opera, and mm -hmm. say um, someone like Berio, you know, where he also deals with, um, uh, with the name of the piece um, that he uses, the Mahler's, uh, that he uses um, Mahler's Second Symphony. Symphonia. Uh, yeah, yeah, Symphonia, right. So it's, um, so if we compare the two, I mean, Berio's pieces, I mean, he was a real craftsman, extremely well composed, but yet it all kind of blends into this montage of carrying the listener along. Mm -hmm. And there's, at least for, from my own perception, there isn't this kind of internal resistance of what it means to bring in these different kinds of materials. Mm. It's very different in Zimmerman, where he actually always maintains this very strict polyphony between the parts. So we actually are forced to hear them separately and, and together at the same time. They don't simply meld into a kind of comfortable, um, you know, can't we all get along kind of um, <laughs> So it, I think I brought this in relationship to my own development that when I was in San Diego, it was writing these pieces that, um, that very much were about sound and structure. And I got to a point where I felt that this was, um, that this was limiting. Mm. Um, in the sense that um, it needed windows to be opened. It needed some kind of roots to grow um, and connect to the outside world. Mm. And so then this is when then I began to, um, you know, then I was stuck in this position like, well, how do I write a gesture when I've completely eliminated it, it, it from my music? Mm -hmm. How do I bring something like a crescendo in there when, um, or, or a trill when I completely exercise these things as just the merely decorative in my, in mm. these more noise pieces. So the only way I could really do it was through, uh, through other people mm. taking a trill from a Mahler symphony or taking a, um, uh, taking a gesture from, from Schoenberg or, um, or a chord from Stockhausen. It, it immediately opened the world of my music to become potentially more complex and it allowed a way for it to go forward. Mm. Because the danger I was in was really painting myself into a corner where, okay, I'd be, you know, do I want to be spending the rest of my life writing these perhaps beautiful noise pieces, but that ultimately are kind of always stuck within their own world. Then the danger is that you're producing merely decorative works. Mm. And um, so for me, it was important to really um, allow the work to, to grow roots. And then that's when I started then transcribing more and more into my music as part of the process. Like what Stravinsky once said, Stravinsky once said that um, I don't compose, I steal, mm -hmm. you know, and it's in a way, um, that's how I was able to bring things like gestures and all these language like rhetorical like aspects of music back into my own music. I love that. 
talk to me about you. I think you prefaced this by talking about it as an experiment. This sort of idea of like a composer of experimental music or an experimental composer, right? You, you differentiate the two in your writings. Uh, I'm not so sure that I do. I mean, um, one thing that I guess I would argue is that the danger that we see, um, especially in, in music education, is that it all becomes about experimentation. But f for myself, at least, there is a kind of danger in which experimentation starts to kind of shift over to this, um, this attitude of, of, of entertainment. And really, there's a danger in which experimentation, particularly in, in the way that we see it in uh, um, some American schools, I would say also in, in some German schools, um, but I would say more in terms of this in the relationship to a kind of late capitalist culture is that mm -hmm. the danger is that it's, it lacks a certain kind of seriousness and um, I would say and a decisively anti-intellectual mm. orientation. And mm. this became quite apparent to me when um, at our Hochschule, we, uh, Steve Reich came and I had to interview Steve Reich. You know, if you think of his early works, they were, they were actually quite experimental, especially the tape pieces, you know, and actually potentially very political works, like I'm coming out. Um, but in this interview, um, he completely rejects any of that kind of discourse around the work. And it really, he really at least wanted to frame his work um, like a pop composer. Look at experimentation historically. I mean, the experimentation has, has, has existed ever since the desire to, to um, create has been there. But what we see is that um, experimentation has always existed in some kind of relationship. I would call it a dialectical relationship with tradition. For example, if we consider the Kun Chu Chinese opera, that was highly experimental opera, but also within a very specific tradition of, of Chinese music. Mm -hmm. um, likewise with something like Erwartung, you know, highly experimental, but also coming out of the German-Austrian tradition of, of late Romanticism. Similarly with someone like, like Lachemann or, or Ferniho, I think the thing that we forget is that both of these composers have a very strong relationship to, to tradition, and especially the German-Austrian tradition. We can see like Ferniho himself has said that my, my music very much comes out of the um, late Romantic, early Expressionist music. It's a kind mm -hmm. of continuation of that. So experimentation is something that I think is extremely important, but when you unhinge experimentation from tradition and mm -hmm. from knowledge, then the danger is that it becomes a kind of, um, it bleeds into this entertainment realm mm. of just having fun with sound. That unfortunately, we, we see a lot of that in Germany now. There was a moment in which that was important, like in the late sixties, you know, um, which in which there really had to be a, um, a critical look at, at, um, at art and, and music after the war. But now it seems like, especially with, um, with the way new music has been kind of um, consolidated in things like festivals, et cetera, f at least from my point of view, there's the danger in which it all becomes um, complicit in a kind of form of, of commercial entertainment. Mm. It reminds me of your, the, the sentiment that you, I think we started this with, was that you, you want your art to confront the listener, that it might not be comfortable at first, that you don't necessarily feel like you fit into this, into this musical world, and yet gradually you sort of begin to, it, it teaches you how to listen to it. No, I, I think that's a good way of putting it. I mean, what I would say, though, is that I would like my music to, to resist the listener at first, but mm -hmm. ultimately I want the listener to lose themselves in my music. Mm -hmm. I, I'm mm -hmm. not after alienating a listener. You know, we have, there are composers, for example, um, where very much the, the desire is to just completely alienate a listener. And the, the difficulty for me about that is then it, that too also makes a listener very passive. You know, you just, for example, you just hear a wall of sound. And after a certain moment, it's like what Lachemann no, has this notion of the texture clong, where basically a texture clong, like, like, for example, just a wall of sound, it loses a relationship to time. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is it engenders a, an essentially passive-like listening. And, and we've experienced that, where you experience this piece, it's, 
it's uncomfortable at first, and then either you just simply get bored or you have to enter into a, some kind of meditative listening. You know, and I think both of those also are part of this whole kind of entertainment-like um, aspect, you know, uh, in the sense that it doesn't fundamentally try to change a listener and mm -hmm. to change their, their uh, and to fundamentally um, expand upon their, the way that they move through the world, the way that they see the world, which I think is kind of the responsibility of art. This, this idea know? of the... Of of the texture clong is as temporal that that experience of it in, in well, it, 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 it's atemporal mm -hmm. yes yeah. basically we, we, we lose a sense of time yeah. and for me music is so much about time and the way we experience time mm -hmm. and the way that the work unfolds that was what i was what i was going to touch on was your your tie back to the subject and the way that you use sort of metrics beats to to approach removing that subject um, as it's a, it, you, you look at it through time. Yeah, uh, t time and rhythm. I mean, the idea <laughs> of there are many gestures that w requires a kind of listening, but at the same time, um, the gestures are never rooted in a specific position. That's what I mean by removing these, this idea of a subject position in the music. Mm. It's never rooted in a particular place from which the gestures emanate. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's, it's, it's confused. And in that sense, then, as a listener, we're unclear in terms of the in, intention of expression. With the confusion of intention, we're, we're all going to hear your works differently. The, there's sort of an individuality, the individual actant in that, in that approach. Is there a, a manner in which you want us to begin? Like when we sit down for the, for the opening bars, is there a mindset, is there a thought an approach that you want us to have that you hope that your listener has in listening to your music? Well, I think any composer would say that what they would fundamentally want is, um, is a serious engagement with the work, mm. you know? So, so I think that's fundamental, but I think that would be fundamental for, for any, any, any composer. Beyond that, I would say no, because <laughs> for me, what's important is the work and it's not about myself as an author of the work. And that this is why I, I bring in many different kinds of texts. It's why I try to destabilize this notion of subject positions in the music, because ultimately I want all this stuff to escape any kind of intentional desire or active expression that I may bring to the piece. Mm. Because I think that musical works for me should somehow approach the complexity of the world that's out there. And the world is far more complex than any kind of single, um, mind or imagination, you know, mm -hmm. and, and this is, brings me back to the, the quotation of the filmmaker Jean-Marie Straub, who's, who's very important in my own work, he, and he once said that uh, patience is more important than imagination. Mm -hmm. You know, imagination is about um, trying to inframe the work with the imagination of the author, you know, and, and trying to be as, as complex as possible, but yet it still always has that author's voice that's breathing behind the work. Patience is different because the materials we bring into a work are far more complex than what we as an individual could ever know about it. Mm. And so that's why I often turn to transcription is I'm bringing things there that, and in a way, my, my role is really just to manage, is to manage their polyphony together, to bring them into the same space, but never to kind of, um, never to express something specific. You know, I never say, well, I'm bringing this quotation in and this one because I want to express, you know, th then we start interpreting the work. Mm -hmm. And then when we interpret the work, we reduce the work. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's important to always keep the work as a kind of high energy construct, as something that's always alive. Um, and I do this through bringing in multiple kinds of things that are often then situated on a very unstable rhythmic metric grounding, but the importance of a, of a composer's craft is really to be able to weave these things together so that it's never about um, one dominating the other, mm. but you weave them in such a way in which they all maintain some kind of polyphony with one another. So, you know, it brings us back to the, um, the opening of the Opus 132, um, but we see this actually th th throughout history, um, in many different composed works uh, of composers where the, the craft really lies in this creating 
a kind of polyphonic space in which very different voices are able to um, speak without being hierarchically dominated by one another. Mm. You know, ending ending of the of the first act of the Meister the Meister Singer, von mm. Neuenberg. The beautiful moment they're all speaking about the, the rules of singing, and you just have this extremely beautiful Italian bel canto. Mm. You know that, that that's sung by the 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 lead. And what Wagner is able to do is create this very interesting polyphony between voices that are half almost speaking, uh, a very different kind of expressive sound world, and then this bel canto sound. And yet one never dominates the other. Mm -hmm. It's this beautiful moment of just being able to put the two into a kind of, um, into a kind of polyphony with one another. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, we see this throughout the, the history of music. I can't think of a better place to close, to close this dialogue. Um, that was beautifully put. And it's, what's amazing is that it's so tangib tangibly reflected in your music, right? There's so much beautiful polyphony um, that we get to, we get to follow, we get to trace those, those lines um, and hear them not just, not just with each other, but within each other. Yeah, well, you know, thanks for saying that. Yeah, it's, I mean, um, when you had asked about what, I, how I would like a listener to, to listen to a work. Also, I, I think the other important thing is, is that oftentimes works require many listenings. Mm -hmm. You know, and I do think it's important that um, if at first the work resists us, then we, we go back to it. Mm. And we go back to it again until we um, find some kind of understanding of it. It may, ultimately, we, um, we may not appreciate it. Um, but as long as time is invested, I think for myself, what's so important is this notion of time, not just in how time is experienced, but how time is brought into the compositional act and how time is brought into the listening act. Because time, in a sense, is something that resists the kind of constant stream of, of capitalism, of fake news, <laughs> you know, um, of always trying to kind of distract and bring in, bring in new things and to get things happening as fast as possible. Mm. And I do think that there's something to be said about, um, about slowness, about slowness in terms of not just composing, but also listening, you know, of trying to kind of stay with the music as you're listening to it. And when you can't listen to it again, you know, for, for me, th that's important. Resist this kind of um, entertainment aspect that we often have around music that is um, like a consumer, that we listen to something and then we th quickly throw it away. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think the power of music is that when we listen to something, something stays there and it, it dwells with us. Um, and we may go back to it again and it continues to dwell with us. And in that kind of, that dwelling with us, it opens up possibilities for our, our worldview to somehow be changed, to somehow feel more, I would argue to feel more empathy for one another, mm. to kind of um, resituate ourselves in a much more complex world in which we're just a very small part. It's amazing. And it, it does change how, how I listen to your music and to other musics as well, right? This is applicable across the board, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're responsible to really listening, not just consuming, to really listening. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, if we have just a second, uh, we, we yes, spoke sir. earlier with, uh, with Haya Chernowin um, uh -huh. as part of this series, and I understand that you were one of her, one of her first students. I was just wondering if you had uh, uh, any memorable stories you'd like to share about, uh, about all that experience. Oh, well, um, when I went to San Diego, I was already in my early 30s. Up to then, I was composing music, and then I went to the summer course, and I met uh, Brian Fernieho, who had a very kind of deep impact on my work. So then I applied to San Diego to work with him. What happened was then he, at that same time, he moved to Stanford. And so then I got to know Haya. And so then I studied with Haya for, for quite a while there. Yeah, she was extremely important. Um, it was really through her that I learned how to trust myself as a composer. You know, I, I'm not sure if, any other composition teacher can lay claim to that. What was important with, with Ferniho, because then I did study with him for a little bit, 
and probably also the way that I approach teaching is um, it's very much situated around um, the work, uh, knowledge, craft, etc. But with Haya, it's you really learn how to trust yourself and and your 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 instincts. And as someone, um, and especially as a, as a young composer, that was extremely important for me. And, and it's really cool that you can continue carrying that right now as a teacher yourself. It's an incredible yeah. lineage. Yeah, lineage uh, too. yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it was. Um, no, it's great. Yeah, any other questions or comments? Or I, I know it's going to be a little bit different with mine because I, you'll be using recordings because um, I'm a very slow composer. And I'm not someone where, um, where I can just write a piece in, in a month or something. It requires a lot of time and also research. I think research is like, for example, with the opera that I'm, I'm working on, which actually, actually that's something we hadn't talked about the opera that I'm working on, already I've done um, several years of research of just putting the libretto together. And, we, and I have a team of people, actually, of people coming from um, theater studies, from media studies, who are helping to kind of contribute. Because the Geistrenzel was different, because in a way everything was more or less contained within this, uh, around the, the, the time of 1600. Mm -hmm. This, this work is extremely different. It, it really stretches the whole notion of aura because here what I'm doing is I'm bringing, well, the, the idea behind the work is um, it begins with this early Chinese Kung Chu opera that I'm reworking from the um, late 1500s um, called the Peony Pavilion in English. But yet what was interesting was that uh, a German translation of it was made in 1937. And so it's really this German translation that becomes the site for all these other kinds of, of texts to enter mm -hmm. in. Because we have um, 1937, you have not only the problems going on in Germany, the rise of national socialism, but over in China, we have um, the whole Nanjing massacre that is not so explicitly taught in, um, in American history, but um, I think it's important to, important to know. And so what happens is, this year really becomes a site in which I try to bring in this early Kunchu opera with references to many other, other um, works. It's amazing. And what's interesting is that the, the original opera itself spans so much further back than, than that year, but to, to focus on the German translation as well and to put it in that context, as well as, of course, the context of you writing it now, it's, <laughs> it's a lot of different layers for us to for us to process at once, a lot of temporal layers for us to process at once. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, um, but what's interesting is that there's so many connections. Mm. You know, when the p and &E Pavilion was being written, The Tempest was being written by, by Shakespeare. In fact, they both died, uh, Tong Shen Zhu, the author of p and &E Pavilion, and Shakespeare both died in the same year. Mm. Um, and they both, Tong Shen Zhu is, um, he's an author that has a similar status in Chinese culture like Shakespeare does in European culture. The works are extremely dense. Um, if you read the opening, if, well, if you read any page of the p and &E Pavilion, um, you'll see that any sentence has multiple footnotes because everything's a quotation of, say, an early Tang Dynasty poem, which is then quoting a poem even before that. So it's this highly dense intertextuality that we also see in Shakespeare. And then when we move to 1937, I mean, it's, you know, we get these, this is when, when, uh, when Mao Zedong wrote the, um, his early texts of, on contradiction and, mm. uh, and on practice, really forming the foundation for the Chinese Communist Party. We have um, Brecht, who was very much influenced by Mao's teachings, right? He took on contradiction and used that as a way to rehearse Shakespeare. We have Brecht writing the Mas Nama, which, which also finds a way into this work because it's a very important um, notion of political theater. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, so there are all these, it's a very, becomes an extremely layered work that is much more dense than anything that was achieved in the um, Geister and Soul. Mm. I, can see, I can see its draw for you as, as a composer with your ideas of transcription of, of the layering of the interaction of those layers. Yeah, and finding these connections. So again, it's like the work is never dominated by any kind of narrative mm -hmm. or storyline or characters. All of that is, is gone. And it really just becomes about the juxtaposition of these different kinds of texts. Mm -hmm. So like I have one text coming from, I think it's around 
500 BC, an early text around that describes the debate between the Confucianists and the legalists. Um, we have texts from the Masnama, from, um, I'm also bringing in this, this J.H. Prynne poem, which I used in my piece, uh, Refuse Collection. And then we have Chinese poetry that was translated into German, beginning with Goethe up through, up through Brecht, for example. And um, what's interesting about this is how the nature of, trans of translation, and also gets to the idea of transcription, how that was fundamentally changed through a European view of what Chinese and East Asian culture was, mm. right? And it was always a view that in a way seek to place China as a kind of at a distance, always the kind of other, the mm. strangeness, something we see even today, you know, which, which upsets me a, a bit, you know, when we see the, um, the reference to the Chinese wet markets, you know, as if these are people that sit around and eat armadillos and, uh, other strange creatures, you know, and that's how we get these viruses circulating. Um, there's, a, there's a slight aspect of, of you know, one could say racism in, in this kind of approach. And so for me, what's important is to take these and to kind of completely destabilize that, that kind of ausblick, mm -hmm. that kind of view onto mm -hmm. Asia and to create a much more complex uh, picture, you know, without diminishing the co potential complexity of the works that, that um, engage with that. For example, Pound, Pound's China Cantos is also very important because I'm using the China Cantos, basically the rhythmic proportioning of the China Cantos is basically the rhythmic structure of the whole first act. It's brilliant. Pound had a very biased, misinformed view of what Chinese history was. Yet at the same time, there are some very rich aspects to the China Cantos, especially in the way that he deals with with rhythm and the, the, the relationship between rhythm and language. So all these things I think are kind of somehow placed in the same space. And then it's really my role to kind of manage them in a, in, in a polyphonic way so that they are counterpointed and one never tries to dominate or flatten or reduce the other, that they're mm -hmm. always placed in a dialectical way. It's amazing that it stretches beyond musical material into the, the sheer politics of humanity. You're approaching a, a dialogue, a dialectic of, of reducing hierarchy between these like innately hierarchical old approaches to art, to language, to culture. Yeah, well, I think but, um, that for, well, for myself, I mean, composing is more than just writing notes or making a piece. It really gets to what you just said, that the work becomes mu much more of a site for, for something else, you know? Mm -hmm something potentially political, something um, that can fundamentally move us in, in, in some way. And for me, one way, one important aspect is to completely, I manage things, I, I compose things, but to also then remove myself as an author mm -hmm. so that it's not about myself. It's really about the kinds of materials that are brought together into this space. Mm. And how they can start to inflect one another. And, and that for me then really gives an opening for complexity because for me, complexity becomes re reduced when we always have the author's voice um, that's breathing behind the work, you know, because then what happens is everything becomes conflated within a single intention or within a set of intentions and, and expressive desires. Yeah. And for me, I'm interested in a kind of lyricism. I mean, lyricism is extremely important in my music a kind of lyricism that moves beyond this, this notion of subjectivity, mm. something that is much more encompassing, that has the possibility to, to move us in, in ways that, um, that don't always bring us back to intention and desire, especially of the composer. I, I, I don't even know how to, how to follow that. Yes. <laughs> it, reads, it reads so beautifully in your music. Right? It's very, oh, very Foucault, right? What is an author? Uh, <laughs> right. And Bart. <laughs> yeah, right. Hold on back. Yeah, well, great. Well, um, I appreciate all of you including me in this project. Our and I hope, I hope in the future we can actually collaborate on a, on a performance together. That'd be well, terrific. Absolutely. Yeah, be cool. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. And um, yeah, I hope we can all meet in person soon. Yes. And I, again, I really uh, salute and, and thank you for the work you're doing. Uh, not just 
irrespective of this, of this uh, virus, but also within this context. I think it shows real invention. And um, yeah, I look forward to, see, to seeing where you, as an ensemble, how you uh, go forward. So are, so are we. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for everything. Thank we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much for your yeah, time. Okay. This was great. Wonderful to meet you. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Everything But the Kitchen Sink. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to hear more, you can find all the episodes of our summer series on our YouTube channel and our website, alneaensemble.org. Also, be sure to check out our social media profiles for more information and previews of upcoming episodes. Our handle is Alinea Ensemble. Please feel free to share today's episode with anybody you think might like it, and don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or comments. Stay tuned for more episodes of Everything But The Kitchen Sink, released every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And as always, we hope you are all safe and well. See you next time. If there is nothing to discover from the beginning, if, if something does not get richer with, with the years, uh, you should, you, you just would have to stop working on it. It's not interesting anymore.